On the final episode of Clive James' fame in the 20th century, Richard Nixon rises to power, then falls. The anti-hero hits the screen. Clint Eastwood, Robert De Niro. Muhammad Ali says he's still the greatest. And the death of Elvis reveals the high price of celebrity. See the greatest cast ever assembled on the final episode of Clive James' fame in the 20th century. Watch Clive James' fame in the 20th century tomorrow night. KPBS San Diego, your station for great performances. Until the 1960s, fame in the 20th century progressed in step with the development of communications technology. But with all the technology in place, up to and including a television set in the kitchen, fame as a force didn't stop its forward march. Suddenly, it broke into a run. The world's most advanced nation elected a president who looked like a film star. Every degree of mind and spirit that I possess will be devoted to the long-range interests of the United States and to the cause of freedom around the world. John Fitzgerald so Kennedy was as physically attractive as Marlon Brando and a lot easier to understand. He didn't look like any previous presidential candidate. He looked more like people who were famous for other things, movies, upmarket sports, fooling around in the sun with beautiful women. The children of the post-war baby boom were tipping the free world's demography towards youth. The presidential candidate looked young. Good evening. The In the famous television debate between Kennedy and Nixon, the experienced Nixon argued at least as well as his upstart opponent. I believe the programs that Senator Kennedy advocates will have a tendency to stifle those creative energies. I really don't need uh, Mr. Nixon to tell me about what my responsibilities are as a citizen. I've served this country for 14 years in the Congress and before that in the service. I've just but in the debate, it was Kennedy's glamour that put him in front. A few viewers claimed that they could see Nixon's five o'clock shadow. Everybody remembered it that way. And eventually, even Nixon agreed that a shave too few had cost him the election. The new president was no mere figurehead. He was able and energetic, as well as attractive and spectacular. So no one at the time questioned whether it was a good thing for the whole free world's combined media resources to churn out stories 24 hours a day about Kennedy as the new King Arthur. There was always JFK's self-deprecating wit to prove that he had things in perspective. He made jokes about himself. I wonder if you could tell us whether if you had it to do over again, you would uh, work for the presidency and whether you could recommend the job to others. Well, the answer is, uh, the first is yes, and the second is no. I don't recommend it to others. Everyone else was allowed to make jokes as well. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. President.
politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet open way. When Khrushchev planted nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba and Kennedy demanded their removal, two famous men got on the telephone to each other, but not in private. They were deciding the fate of the world, and the world knew all about it. The third famous man, Fidel Castro, wasn't even consulted. The missiles were in his country, but the real arena was the worldwide media. Politics had become personalized to an unprecedented degree, at least partly because JFK was such an attractive person. Part of the president's attraction was an attractive first lady. Classy, cultivated, good at languages, Jackie Kennedy grew world famous alongside her husband. The Western world was turning into a single TV network and a large proportion of the Earth's total population tuned in to watch Jackie conducting a tour of the White House. Everything here has been in the White House at some time. And um, the thing that we're going to do that's going to be interesting is so many treaties have been signed in this room. The archives is, are going to give us copies of them all, and we're going to frame them and have them all around the walls so that you can really see this is such a historic room. With Jack and Jackie installed in the White House as a modern Ferdinand and Isabella without the PR problem, America's reverse conquest of the old world continued. America's cultural influence had become so seductive that countries which had fought a long rearguard action to retain their own identities showed signs of retreating into fantasy. Bond. James Bond. Britain's fictional secret agent, James Bond, was an acknowledgement that most of Britain's factual spies had turned out to be homosexuals working for the KGB. The reassuringly heterosexual Sean Connery became inextricably identified with the role. Oh, it's lost its chill. Oh, why, you? Oh, there's another in the fridge. Who needs it? My dear girl, there are some things that just aren't done, such as drinking Dom Perignon 53 above a temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. The script said Britain had no independent power left. It was in partnership with the Americans. But Connery gave Bond a physical presence, no. reflecting the influence that Britain would have liked to have had. Interesting. Where were you measured for this, bud? My tailor, several row. That's so. Mine's a guy in Washington. Felix Leiter, Central Intelligence Agency. You must be James Bond. Britain had less power than it used to have, but made more news. Britain's secretary for war was John Profumo. He became involved with a svelte courtesan called Christine Keeler. Profumo was James Bond, and Keeler was pussy galore. He was upper class, and she had only her looks. The soir Profumo found his Italian-sounding name permanently stuck on a very British style of media-maximized sex sensation. Britons were finding themselves so fascinating that the world was fascinated too. Peter Sellers could speak in a variety of British accents. This happens to be an RAF uniform, sir. And I am Group Captain Lionel Mandrake. He was a walking General class Richard system. I must say, it's very heartening having you intellectuals coming into the working class movement like this. One has to do something. <laughs> true, brother, true. I see from your particulars you was at college in Oxford. Yes, I was. Yes, I was up there myself. Oh, really? Yes, I was at the Balliol Summer School, 1946. Very good toast and preserves they give you at tea time, as you probably know. No, I didn't know, actually. Hollywood got interested, but couldn't quite figure out what to do with him until they made him a Frenchman. Oui, monsieur. Do you have a rim? A rim? What? You said, do I have a rim? I know perfectly well what I said. I said, do you have a rim? You mean, do I have a room? That is what I have been saying, you fool. Do you have a reservation? I am Inspector Clouseau of the Sûreté, and I am here on official police business. America was still the land of the sirens, 
and siren number one was Elizabeth Taylor. Taylor had won her first fame as a young star of outstanding beauty. In Father of the Bride, she had thrilled the world with her portrayal of the pretty girl on the verge of marriage. But one of the reasons she thrilled the world was that the world knew she had already been the bride of hotel heir Nicky Hilton. Later, she went on to be the wife of the British film star Michael Wilding, whose noble profile included the kind of stiff upper lip needed to cope with the extent by which her fame outstripped his. She moved onward and upward to become the wife of the very famous American impresario, Mike Todd. Not just their wedding, but their entire brief marriage was a media event. After Todd's death in a plane crash, Taylor took the famous singer Eddie Fisher away from his famous wife, Debbie Reynolds. That too became a media saga. Elizabeth Taylor. As an actress, Taylor had her limitations. When she accepted the Oscar for Butterfield 8, her speech was more passionate than the role. I don't really know how to express my gratitude for this and for everything. I guess all I can do is say thank you. Thank you with all my heart. Taylor was the only star famous enough to play Cleopatra. Richard Burton played Mark Antony. Cleopatra had a bigger budget than the original Roman Empire, but its story of a man losing his soul for an exotic temptress suddenly acquired a whole new resonance. The movie went over the top in every way long before it was finished and would have finished the studio if it had not been for the extra publicity earned by Burton and Taylor's off-screen love affair. The affair wasn't really off-screen at all. It was a media event as over the top as the movie and with only a slightly smaller budget. Burton became Taylor's favorite husband. She married him as often as possible. Burton and Taylor were a media double act. Beyond their film stardom, there was this new, bigger stardom of just being talked about all the time. Burton manfully strove to look cheerful at winning all the world's treasures that his intelligence told him were meaningless. He was living in the fame country, the international land of luxury hotels linked by first-class flights. It was a long way from anywhere, and he had the nagging thought that it was on the way to somewhere he didn't like. Ernest Hemingway had been heading in the same direction for a long time and finally reached his destination. It was the ending he seemed to have been planning from the beginning. His premature old age was brought on by his relentless pursuit of a young man's sensations. In Africa, on the hunt for the few remaining animals he had not already killed, he had a plane crash and woke up to read his own obituaries. When he recovered, he went fishing. He could never have enough of killing living things. Finally, he did it to himself. He had bagged his last trophy. Marilyn Monroe also wrote her own last chapter. For some time, the press had been carrying stories of the drugs she took to make her sleep. The press didn't yet know that she scarcely had time to sleep because she was having love affairs with both Jack and Bobby Kennedy. She was practically part of the Kennedy administration. It didn't help. Her story was the one about the woman who couldn't cope with world fame. It could only have one ending. To supply it was practically her duty. The living woman moved aside to make room for the memories. be spread so thin. I'm just one person. I don't want to be rolled out like a pastry, so everybody get a nice big bite of me. Mm -hmm. 
Judy Garland knew exactly what had happened to Marilyn Monroe. It had been happening to her all her life. No one knows better than I myself. Garland's last movie, I Could Go On Singing, was all about her own agony as a desperately insecure drug addict who couldn't cope with stardom. How I wanted love and fell. Now I say, what the hell? Oh. Garland's problem was that her public wanted her to be hopeless. Her albums outsold even Elvis Presley, but it wasn't just because he was a great singer. It was because he was a great tragedy. Fame could glamorize anything. Not even the closed East was free from the influence of the Americanized, glamorized West. The ballet dancer Rudolf Nureyev was a big star in Russia, but he was artistically stifled and he wanted the world. He got it by defecting. At first, all the attention stunned him, but he soon got to like it. Nureyev was the first male ballet dancer who was box office like the ballerinas. When he formed a partnership with the Royal Ballet's prima ballerina Margot Fontaine, it was the first time she had danced with a male partner as famous as she was. It was good news for Nureyev and his art, but it was bad news for the Soviet Union. Any would-be world-famous citizen they produced was always likely to do a flit, unless his transport arrangements could be fixed so that he couldn't leave the country without having to come back. In a powerful counterstroke against the glamour of Kennedy's America, the Soviet Union sent a man into space. He was Yuri Gagarin, and he was the only cosmonaut able to shave accurately. Gagarin's cheeks were as smooth as Kennedy's. Most of his colleagues had a blue jaw like Nixon. If Gagarin had sported the usual communist stubble, the message would have been that they couldn't build an electric shaver. Gagarin's peachy jowls told the world that Soviet technology was as successful in the bathroom as on the launch pad. The watching world was more inclined to welcome Gagarin as a world citizen than as an instrument of propaganda. Nevertheless, it could not be denied that the Russians were one up. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Kennedy's reaction to the Soviet space success was to forecast a feat beyond the dreams of Lindbergh, Destination Moon. The Kennedy optimism would take mankind to the stars. What could go wrong? From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. The assassination of the world-famous JFK made Lee Harvey Oswald world-famous too, but there was no time to ask him if that was why he did it, if he did it. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. The assassination of the world-famous Lee Harvey Oswald made Jack Ruby world-famous too, but only for a few days. JFK's fame lived on, pure, unsullied, brighter even than before. 
the gap between the radiant all-media megastar and the fallible human being had not had time to show itself. Like a star's handprint in concrete, JFK's myth was set in legend. The American dream, however, was in pieces. The Beatles helped put the British dream back together. For the young, pop music was better than any empire. The Beatles were inspired by American popular culture, but made it their own. The Beatles were made in Britain. They were something to be proud of. They were fun. Even those older people who disapproved had fun disapproving. Younger people said nothing because they were too busy screaming, especially the girls. Somewhere in the middle of the noise, the Beatles scarcely had national identity on their minds. They already had a new nationality, fame, the country without borders. Riding to the rescue of the shattered American dream came John, Paul, George and Ringo. They arrived in America to the same reaction they had already aroused in Britain. America's Bob Dylan was so authentic, he made you wonder. Dylan's songs evoked a childhood of blue-collar poverty and hopping freights. Actually, his name was Robert Zimmerman. He had a middle-class background, and the only freight he ever hopped was his mother's car to school but he had a seductive message. He transformed rebellion into protest. Rebellion had been for crazy mixed up kids like James Dean. Protest said that society was mixed up. Dylan's audience was all the people young enough to believe that society was repressing their creative originality. Come gather round people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times, they are a-changing If you were young, or could pass for young in the dark, the popular music star was a new kind of hero, even more seductive than the film star. Come to my beach shack, you'll be comfortable there. You believe it now? Be my guest, have a snack. See how nice I treat company in my little beach shack. Do you hear it now? Meanwhile, the man who started it all was wasting his time being a film star. The new pop heroes might have found it harder to grab the world's attention if Elvis and his handlers had realized that the young wanted good albums, not bad movies. I wish you would. Don't be afraid, girl. My intentions are good. You believe me now. I know girls rather pack. There's no one I won't fail but you in my little beach shack. Rock stars could sing what they liked, but film stars couldn't set up their own movies. Only one film star was big enough to even try. Marlon Brando, still Hollywood's number one brooding outcast, took his revenge on the Hollywood system he hated when it starred him as Fletcher Christian in the remake of Mutiny on the Bounty. Brando did a stunning job of almost getting an upper-class English accent right. He played the role as a brooding outcast who had been to Eton. Well, perhaps you're right, sir. I'd be careful of that cheese if I were you, sir. It has a peculiar smell. I think it's a bit tainted. 
Then, of course, it's a question of individual taste. It's a damn good port, hmm? But Brando's real brilliance went into disguising his famous problem about learning his lines. But you're wrong, me, sir. You believe that I would willfully obstruct our progress. You could only just tell that he was looking past Trevor Howard to read the cue cards. But that's absurd, sir. Why should I not wish to do my best? Because you are the sort of self-styled gentleman who thinks only one thought. You feel only one emotion, contempt. Generously turning out to publicize movies he was sorry that he had ever made, Brando seemed to enjoy the grief he was giving to the men in suits. There were mutterings in the industry that no star, least of all Brando, would ever be given such power again. In Britain, the Rolling Stones mounted their challenge to the establishment by rising to prominence without cleaning up their act. Unlike the Beatles, the Stones were obviously not a bunch of basically adorable urchins that even parents couldn't help feeling protective about. The mere appearance of the Stones' frontman, Mick Jagger, was enough to make parents call the police. On the matter of drugs, Jagger paid no lip service to hypocrisy despite looking as if he could pay lip service to a locomotive. The stone stood for the youth culture, which rejected the values of the established order so as to recover the concept of shared humanity while making sensible investments with the record royalties. The stones were among the gurus of the new vision. Gurus of the old vision were still selling tickets. You see, the human soul is so large that the world cannot fill it. All the popularity and all the money and all the sex experience, everything cannot fill your soul. Only God can fill it. Christians who were shocked by the mass appeal of the rock stars were glad to hear Billy Graham reaffirming Christian values. It's been a long time since evangelism and revival and Christ and God was front page news around the world. And we thank God for it. But Billy Graham himself was more like a rock star than like Christ, who never rented a stadium with a giant screen TV relay. The division between idealistic youth and untrustworthy age would have remained more clear cut if the new gurus had not gone in search. Che Guevara had the advantage of remaining inaccessible. Born in Argentina, he helped Fidel Castro liberate Cuba from Batista and the Yankees. Put in charge of the new revolutionary Cuban economy, he proved his detachment from material things by running it into the ground. Prudently packed off by Fidel to help revolutionize Bolivia, he was captured by the forces of reaction and killed. From then on, he could only be read about, and his true fame began. Che's poster was pinned on the wall of every student who believed that the kind of man who'd been unable to organize anything more complicated than a small ambush held the secret of a new kind of society based on love and peace. His beret was a halo. He was a kind of non-singing rock star.
An even more unlikely object of worship for young Westerners seeking liberation was China's all-powerful ruler, Mao Zedong. Earlier in his career as the Chinese People's Republic's supreme source of all wisdom, Mao had been cheered by his people, while behind the scenes he was killing more of them than Hitler and Stalin put together ever managed to kill of theirs. This process was called the Great Leap Forward. In the 1960s, Mao prepared a repeat performance of the Great Leap Forward. This time it was called the Cultural Revolution. Students waved Mao's little red book while demanding punishment for anyone who had committed the crime of growing old and set in his ways. Anyone, that is, except Mao. Jean-Paul Sartre was merely the most prominent French intellectual glad to acknowledge Mao's tendencies. But Sartre did it on a world scale. For the serious young of all ages, Jean-Paul Sartre was a guru of Maharishi-like profundity. According to Sartre, the occasional apparent injustice in the East was merely part of an historic process, whereas the West was threatened by the infinitely more evil American-style mass consumer society and its insidious cultural influence. For anyone under 30 years of age and seven feet in height, John Wayne was America's insidious cultural influence. Maximum elevation and destroy the troops, fall back. His Vietnam movie, The Green Berets, explained how the Americans had come on a crusade to save a small Southeast Asian country from destruction. In reality, the crusade was somewhat compromised by the scale of the destruction the Americans were causing on their own account, but Wayne wasn't concerned with reflecting reality. He was out to change it by using his fame as the strolling, drawling straight shooter. This reputation was based entirely on movie appearances, and when not on screen, he was just another actor who collected paintings and wives. But in his own mind, he was what he was famous for, and he could safely assume that his fans felt the same way. What wants you to have that? What, 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 what will happen to me now? You let me worry about that Green Beret. You're what this is all about. Back at home, my young white place, the Green Beret has met his face. He has died for those oppressed. All the world's young liberals thought that the Green Berets was the funniest movie in the world. I am the greatest. Cassius Clay had been laughing at that stuff all his life. He thinks that he's the real heavyweight champ, but after I'm finished, he'll just be a tram. Now, I'm not saying this just to be funny, but I'm fighting on him because he needs the money. <laughs> Winner of the Golden Gloves and an Olympic gold medal, a world heavyweight champion of unmatched speed and grace, he was the latest and most electrifying example of a youngster fighting his way out of the ghetto to an unlimited future. He was young, gifted, and black. A famous phrase at the time, although he could easily say better things himself. You know how great I am. I don't have to tell you about my strategy. I can't let my trainer tell you, Bodine, come here. Bodine, tell him, what are we going to do? You're going to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah, that's what we're going to do. You heard it. That's my trainer. He's told you. Clay seemed made for the American dream, but his response to being drafted for Vietnam was not to go. No, I will not go 10,000 miles to uh, help or kill innocent people. He was sentenced to five years in jail and had his title withdrawn. But he never stopped being news. The heavyweight champion had proved that in his case, the fame was bigger than the name. He stood for something so he could call himself anything. Why do you insist on being called Muhammad Ali now? now? That's the name given to me by my leading teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's my right. original name. That's a black man named Cassius Clay was my slave name. I'm no longer a slave. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up 
live out the true meaning of its creed. Vietnam wasn't Ali's war, and it wasn't Martin Luther King's war either. He had another war on his hands. Before Martin Luther King, there had already been a movement towards black civil rights in the United States. With Martin Luther King, the movement became a man. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream to make. He made nonviolence a principle and put his life on the line to back it up. His weapon was to have no weapons. The way of Gandhi, moral authority. It made him a moving target. The target grew larger when he condemned the social conditions which sent black young men to do more than their share of dying for a country in which they did less than their share of living. He came out against the Vietnam War. President Kennedy said on one occasion, mankind must put an end to war. A war will put an end to mankind. That made him the embodiment of the whole civil rights movement. It was really no surprise least of all to King himself, when someone decided that if the body could be hit in the head, the whole thing would die. The news of King's assassination circled the earth and darkened the sky like the ash of an exploding volcano. From all over the world, the cry converged on the US, physician, heal thyself. But who would be the physician? pretty good land. I'm not saying you never had it so good, but that is a fact, isn't it? It wasn't going to be Lyndon Baines Johnson. The dead President Kennedy's successor had a hard act to follow. JFK had turned the presidency into a beauty contest, and LBJ lost it. Vietnam was too big to fix. The young who ruled the world were singing, hey, 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 LBJ. How many kids did you kill today? He had achieved anti-fame. At the end of his first full term, he quit cold. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Robert Kennedy offered himself for the job. He had built his career as an anti-communist investigator, not much more scrupulous than Nixon, and he almost totally lacked his elder brother's public charm. The Democratic ticket, on the basis of the record that has been made over the last three and a half years by the Democratic administration under President Kennedy. But JFK's fame, intensified by early death, worked for his brother too. It worked for the whole family. Scorpios, the tiny island that shot into the headlines when Jackie Kennedy, America's former first lady, became the second Mrs. Aristotle Onassis. When JFK's widow, Jackie, formed an alliance with Aristotle Onassis, her behavior was judged on the basis that she was a Kennedy. If she had still been Jacqueline Bouvier, no one would have batted an eye. As things were, for JFK's widow to embrace a ship owner in elevator shoes was regarded as a step down in every sense but she had little choice except to seek protection. She was too famous to be out alone. To carry the Kennedy name was to wear a target. The only refuge was in hiding, and Bobby had left that far behind on his way to the presidency in a storm of light. He got as far as a kitchen in Los Angeles, where for reasons still obscure, a gunman called Sirhan Sirhan acquired his share of the dubious fame earned by Lee Harvey Oswald. This time, the news didn't have to be announced by Walter Cronkite. The whole thing was on network TV before the body was cold. Dead before he could be elected, Bobby Kennedy still took a share of his older brother's eternal luster. Like the family funeral, fame had become part of the Kennedy inheritance.
Killing someone famous was a route to fame for Charles Manson. When he murdered Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, he finally got the attention he had always craved. In an earlier incarnation, Manson had been a would-be rock star who auditioned for the monkeys. By turning him down, they produced the same effect as the Vienna art school that turned down Hitler. The Manson murders were unusually repellent in their satanic cruelty, but almost equally repellent was the fact that Manson got his fame. The judge made a fool of himself, again. Well, then he questions my sanity. Are you saying? I question his, huh? Are you saying? Saying? Yes. That's relative. Media coverage was total, and he reveled in it. This confusion belongs to you. It's your confusion. I don't have any confusion. I don't have any guilt. I know what I've done, and no man can judge me. I judge me. What have you done for me? Jail walls weren't enough to keep the media out. Manson was the face of America that the world didn't want to see, but couldn't take its eyes off. Paul Newman was the face of America that the world did want to see. He had spent the early part of his career in Marlon Brando's shadow. He was just as handsome as Brando, but seemed too nice. This quality now came in handy as Hollywood saw that big money could be made out of anti-establishment social rebellion, provided that the anti-establishment social rebels were nice guys. Would you make a jump like that you didn't have to? I have to, and I'm not gonna. Well, we got to, otherwise we're dead. In Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the other nice guy social rebel was played by Robert Redford and his friendly teeth. Marlon Brando had turned the part down. They'll kill us. Maybe. You want to die? Do you? All right. I'll jump first. No. Nope. Then you jump first. No, I said. What's the matter with you? I can't swim! <laughs> Why, are you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. The movie was a huge hit, and Redford overnight joined Newman as a superstar, a new word that meant a star who could make any movie he wanted. Social rebellion had paid off. Twentieth-century fame had always been a value-free commodity. The notion that its freedom from value might be a value in itself was promoted as a social theory by the New York artist and style guru Andy Warhol. Warhol first won fame for pop paintings that looked as if anyone could have painted them. Andy, do you think that pop art has sort of reached the point where it's becoming repetitious now? Uh, yes. Do you think it should break away from being pop art? Uh, no. Are you just going to carry on? Uh, yes. He won more fame when he started producing silk screen posters of dead icons, increasing their posthumous fame while causing some experts in pharmacology to observe that he looked as if he had already achieved posthumous fame while he was still alive. But what made Warhol lastingly famous was his announcement that in the future, everyone would be famous for 15 minutes. Whether or not it was accurate as a prediction, it certainly matched the temper of the times. Look at Andy. If anyone ever looked like nobody, it was him. And think how far he had gone. And think how far he was going. After a decade of planning, hard work, we're willing and ready to attempt to achieve our national goal. His name was Neil Armstrong, and he was going to the moon. Armstrong was chosen to be the man who would actually step onto the moon first because he was held to possess the right qualities of utter dependability and dedication. But all the other astronauts possessed those qualities too. They were all long on virtue and short on individual characteristics. With their haircuts from a previous decade and their values from a previous era, a blast from the past on its way to the future, they were all the same man with slightly different wives. As personalities, they barely registered. Armstrong did his best to rise to the historic moment. He prepared a line which he would say when he stepped onto the moon's surface. That's one small step for a man, 
one giant leap for mankind. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Since man and mankind are the same thing, what he said was strictly meaningless. But it didn't really matter what he said. Armstrong could have been someone else and the result would have been the same. He was world famous without ever having emerged from obscurity. He didn't need a personality. The man with the personality was about to get into the act. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. The man with the personality was there to welcome the moon hero back from space and bathe in the reflected glory. JFK had set the project up and Nixon reaped the reward. Nixon wasn't as flagrant as LBJ, who had been so keen to be associated with orbiting astronauts that he would have caught them in his outstretched arms when they returned to Earth, if he had been allowed to. Nixon knew how to play the scene. Cynic said that Tricky Dick was up to his usual games. But maybe the bad guy was the right guy for the job. If America could conquer space, it might work the other trick and bring all those other boys back home from the jungle. Suddenly, Nixon was looking like the man. With no good name to lose, everything he could bring off was a plus. The most famous man in the world, he had nothing left to fear. Unless, of course, not that it was likely, he made some stupid mistake. There can be no whitewash at the White House. Tomorrow night, Clive James concludes his look at the nature of fame in the 20th century as he examines the ever-changing face of fame. The word Watergate enters the language as the new Richard Nixon rises to power and falls. I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Muhammad Ali proves he's still the greatest. The Hollywood leading man changes his image from the sensitive Tom Joad to the avengeful Dirty Harry. You're thinking, did he fire six shots or only five? America moves from presidents as performers to performers as presidents. As Ronald Reagan takes the helm, Western fame strikes an Eastern politician, Mikhail Gorbachev, and an English prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Sylvester Stallone slugs his way to stardom. Arnold Schwarzenegger builds himself up into an international icon. Charles and Di marry with a promise to live happily ever after. Or so we thought. MTV rocks into our lives, and Madonna and Michael are everywhere. John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Saddam Hussein, and Woody Allen are just some members of the greatest cast ever assembled, appearing on the concluding episode of Clive James' Fame in the 20th Century.
Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.